In this lecture, we're continuing the theme of intentional foundation, that is, as opposed to organic growth or later imposed order, that we've seen previously at cities such as Cahun and Amarna in Egypt and Olynthus in Greece. In this lecture, we add Alexandria to that list. Alexandria also represents a number of developments in ancient cities. It shows the continuation of the pattern of religious buildings as key structures in the urban landscape. A pattern actually begun at Shadol Hoyok and seen as well at Jericho, Uruk, and later cities such as Athens. It extends the Greek version of or orthogonal planning to new areas. And it also provides another form of evidence for the forms of city buildings reflecting the forms of government within them. Now, as the first major city we've seen built directly on the seacoast, it demonstrates the security of Alexander the Great's empire, as well as the primary role of transportation in the city's foundation. The harbor, royal palace complex, and sanctuaries are the key elements in the city's physical makeup, as it creates a new Alexandrian identity for its inhabitants, who are drawn from around the eastern Mediterranean. Alexandria was the first massive cosmopolitan city we know from antiquity, with perhaps 300,000 people at its height, making it on second only to Rome in size. And Rome's great size came much later. In many ways, I believe it's useful to consider San Francisco as a parallel for the international character and historic development of Alexandria. As the second most densely populated city in the U.S. after New York City, San Francisco developed in many ways similar to uh, Alexandria. Its initial placement was due to its harbor, which was seen as its main feature. Its early growth was because of that harbor and the access that gave to the entire region on the interior of California, so that it was a transportation hub not just for the city, but for all of the inland area around it. As it grew, San Francisco attracted immigrants from a wide range of areas and developed a number of ethnic neighborhoods. Chinatown, begun as a, road, as a home for the railroad workers, is the most famous. But there was also a Japan town, and the Mission District was settled originally by immigrants from Germany, Scandinavia, and Italy. Other neighborhoods were predominantly African-American, Mexican, or Irish. And I think these are useful parallels as we begin to discuss Alexandria. Well, I'm going to spend part of our precious time here whining a bit, or if you prefer the British, whinging. I wish there were time to tell even a fraction of the amazing stories that have come down to us about Alexander the Great. You can learn more about him in the Great Courses lectures on Alexander with Professors uh, Kenneth Harl and Jeremy McInerney. We here must sadly restrict ourselves to just a few facts. These include the birth of Alexander in 356 BC as the son of Philip of Macedon. His mission, Alexander's mission, to revenge the Greek people for their occupation in the Persian War by invading and conquering the Persian Empire. That successful invasion and conquest of the Persian Empire led to a diffusion of Greek colonies and occupation that stretched from the Mediterranean Sea to India. And most relevant for us, the decision to rule that new empire by founding cities and creating a joint Greek native culture. Okay, we have time for one story at least. It involves Alexander and his initial meeting with the architect Denocrates of Rhodes. Denocrates is one of these people you, you read about, you may meet them, in fact, in, in, in daily life, who, we'll just say, does not lack for personal confidence. No self-esteem problems with Denocrates of Rhodes. Frustrated, however, in his attempts to gain a personal, a private audience with Alexander the Great, which was kind of cheeky when you think about it, Denocrates showed up to one of Alexander's great public audiences dressed as Hercules. He was a tall, well-built man, and he, as you might imagine, attracted attention, wearing only a lion skin and carrying a club. Well, he got the attention of Alexander, and from that he was able to make his pitch. He proposed building a city for Alexander the Great by carving all of Mount Athos in northern Greece into the form of a man, 
holding in his outstretched left hand the city Dinocrates proposed to found, and in his right a libation bowl. This is a form of vessel that you use to, to make a libation or an offering to the gods. In a sanctuary, you put wine in it and you tip it and pour it out onto the ground as, a, as an offering to the gods. Well, in this case, um, it's a libation bowl into which all of the waters that flowed down the mountain were collected before they plunged into the sea. You might say that the audacious vision caught Alexander's attention. And while he rejected the proposal as impractical... In fact, he criticized it pretty, pretty carefully and thoughtfully. He retained Dinocrates at his court. And so Dinocrates stays with Alexander the Great, apparently not doing much for a number of years. But when Alexander decided in 331 BC to found a city along the Mediterranean coast of Egypt as the great harbor his empire needed and as its western anchor, he turned to Dinocrates of Rhodes. Now, I wanted to say just a little something here. I've mentioned that um, he viewed this as his western anchor of his, of his empire. And that is somewhat speculative. And I, I get that idea actually from my undergraduate advisor, um, Rufus Fears, who speculated or believed, let's say, that when Alexander founded Alexandria in Egypt, he had intended to found another Alexandria, a second one in the east, about in the area today where Karachi, Pakistan is, right down off of the mouth of the Indus River. And the thought was that these would be the two anchors for the great empire. But of course, Alexander passed away before he could achieve that, but we still have um, the city of Alexandria in Egypt. Now, Alexander approved the plans of Dinocrates, but when it came time to lay out the city, they, they found that they didn't have enough chalk to draw the lines, and so they resorted to using grain instead. I love this idea. It means that Alexandria was literally founded on grain, a symbolic act for the city that became the greatest harbor of the Mediterranean and the largest exporter of grain, particularly during the Roman period. Well, despite his spectacular and theatrical plans for Mount Athos, Dinocrates created a plan for, Alex for Alexandria that was, by this time, traditional. He used Hippodamian planning to grid out the area. The city was defined by a series of long east-west avenues, each about 100 feet wide. Now let's stop and just compare that to earlier cities. Some earlier cities we've seen have had broad avenues um, marked out, but they were on the order of 20, 25, or 27 feet wide. Here, 100 feet wide is colossal. These avenues really make up the length of the city. So the length of the city runs east-west, and they run parallel to each other and to the coast. These are all crossed by those shorter, narrower streets, which are typical in Hippodamian planning, that run north-south and um, create the, the blocks that we're familiar with. The fact that we have this regular grid is not to say that the city lacked any dramatic features. Dinocrates exploited two areas of higher ground, one near the Great Harbor and one further inland for sanctuaries. The large temples of Poseidon overlooking the harbor and Serapis, about whom more later, overlooking much of the city, served as landmarks in the otherwise flat city. You can think about Uruk with its artificial ziggurat platforms and its temples on them, or Athens with the great temple of Athena on as antecedents for this type of, of, of city building. It's different than the traditional Hippodamian planning that we saw at Miletus or Ephesus that did not have these landmark features. The greatest landmark, however, was at the harbor, and it achieved fame as a spectacular creation almost instantly. The great harbor of Alexandria was created by incorporating a small island, Pharos, into the enormous breakwaters that were needed to make that artificial harbor. At the end of the island, on the right to, to those entering the harbor, was the lighthouse of Alexandria, called the Pharos from transference of the, the island's name to the lighthouse. One of the most famous buildings in antiquity, images of it survive in almost every artistic medium, um, 
paintings, mosaics, coins, terracotta reliefs, and terracotta and bronze statuettes. There are images of the great lighthouse at Alexandria um, all over the ancient world, from the time of its founding through the late Roman period. The lighthouse, considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was a great tower and really a fire platform that burned night and day to guide ships safely to port. The dimensions of the lighthouse are reported in various ancient sources, um, and they vary enormously. But it was perhaps as much as 450 feet tall. To give you an idea, um, the Washington Monument in, in Washington, D.C. is 550 feet tall. So we're talking about an enormous tower, particularly given ancient building practices. The light was said to be visible at night over a hundred miles away to guide ships into Alexandria. It was decorated with statues of what the, the inscriptions call the Savior Gods. And these are the gods that one prayed to for salvation on a sea voyage. Sea voyages in antiquity are dicey affairs, and it's very risky to, to, to sail. And so we find a lot of, um, of people who make prayers or votive offerings to save your gods at harbors around the Mediterranean. Here at um, Alexandria, the savior gods probably included Poseidon, who, as I mentioned, whose temple overlooked the harbor, and the Greek rulers of Egypt after the death of Alexander, the Ptolemies, particularly Ptolemy I, who was responsible for much of the building of Alexandria, um, is known as one of these savior gods. Well, the lighthouse collapsed in an earthquake in the 14th century, so we can't see it today. The stones from the building were used to construct a fort that still exists today, however, on the foundations of the original lighthouse. So you can see where it was, and you can see some of the materials that made up, um, made up the building. The scale of the pharos and the idea of evoking a sense of wonder in viewers is a theme of art and architecture under the successors of Alexander, which we're going to explore more in the next lecture on Pergamon. But I just wanted to set the stage for that here. Well, Alexandria, eventually, as I said, a city of about 300,000 people, was essentially a Greek occupation in Egypt. Now, Egypt had been an independent country, its own unified country, dating back to about 3200 B.C. It had been occupied by the Assyrians in 664 B.C. and periodically after that by other peoples, particularly the Persians. And so when Alexander conquered the Persian Empire, he effectively got Egypt as part of that. And so what we have here is a Greek occupation on a community that has been here and considers themselves a nationality um, since about 3200 BC, although they have been occupied for about 300 years prior to the Greek invasion. The Greek rulers and the ruling classes that came with them brought their own political system, culture, language, and architecture, and imposed this, all of this, on the land with all of these of its own, all these features of its own, much older and, and really unified. So they have a problem, the Greek rulers. In order to maintain the peace in this occupied area, the Greek planners and rulers of Alexandria created a new form of separation in the city, not by class occupation or wealth, as we have seen previously in cities, but by ethnic group. And this is actually, it is unique. It's, it's never been seen before in an ancient city. Various quarters of the city of Alexandria were developed specifically for Greeks, non-Greeks, and native Egyptians. This developed through two processes. First, the Jews were granted their own governance in an exclusive area of the city, and second, the Greek immigrants did not readily mix with the native Egyptians, out of a feeling of superiority. Rakotis is the name of the native Egyptian quarter, within which the Serapeum, the great temple to Serapis, was found. Brukium is the royal um, Greek Macedonian quarter, and so this is sort of the high-rent district. This is the area that occupied the front of the Great Harbor with public buildings, which include the museum and the famous library. This was the cultural, economic, and administrative heart of the city. 
And as far as we can tell, these distinctions were maintained. I've studied some of the inscriptions of people from Alexandria in the Roman period and published them as well. And um, what's interesting is that even then, in the Roman period, four, five hundred years after the founding of the city, we still see people making a distinction between whether they're Egyptian or whether they're Alexandrian. And the Alexandrians are the ones with Greek names. And so this sort of social distinction by ethnic group holds for at least, as far as I can tell in the inscriptions, 500 years. Well, we also have that other quarter, the Jewish quarter, which was almost as large as the Greek quarter and home to the largest Jewish community in the world at that time. This quarter was governed by a Jewish council and laws. The Alexandrian Jews essentially had their own walled city, because each of these quarters is walled off separately, ruled by 71 elders and a figure called an ethnarch. That's Greek for leader of the people. The Jews here retained their Jewish culture and religion, but also eventually learned Greek and were citizens of Alexandria, not Egypt. An important distinction in Ptolemaic Egypt. Well, along with these three major groups of Greeks, Egyptians, and non-Greek foreigners, as, as demonstrated by the Jews, um, there were, as is typical for a major harbor community, large numbers of foreigners who came from the east, as far as India, and from the west, as far as modern Spain. Alexandria worked. It's really remarkable. It's a successful international community, almost immediately. Again, in some ways, I think very like San Francisco, with distinct neighborhoods around the bay and drawing people from all of the areas connected to it by trade. The metropolis of Alexandria was also unique at the time for its construction, almost completely of stone. Unlike earlier cities, the builders used no mud, brick, or timber. And by earlier cities, I don't just mean in the distant past, like Shalol Hoyok or, or Eruk. I mean Athens of the 5th century BC had a number of mud brick houses. And so common vernacular building was, was often mud brick. But here, extraordinarily, it's all um, stone. And so without the mud brick and without timber, you essentially have a, a, a city that is fireproof and permanent. All of those natural disasters that, uh, that plague cities um, don't affect Alexandria. It took a truly extraordinary event, such as the torching of the Great Library of Alexandria, um, whenever and by whomever it was burned. Uh, there's a number of, uh, of options in antiquity. But it took something like that to create an urban disaster. In spite of the fame of that fire that destroyed um, the library, uh, and it was certainly not a single incident, but a series of fires and other calamities uh, at different times, um, the rest of the city was not affected. And so it's quite extraordinary that you have something that is a major incident um, that, um, that really does not affect the city around it. Um, even with that fire, wherever it was, the effect of disasters like that was limited by the stone architecture. Think in contrast of, um, of the city of Rome. When fire swept through Rome, it could be almost impossible to extinguish because of the high number of timber buildings. Um, I think about the great fire of Rome in, um, in 64 AD, which burned um, much of the center of the city. Um, Ten of the 14 neighborhoods in Rome were destroyed. Massive destruction because of the timber construction. Well, peace among the various ethnic groups and their continued acceptance of Greek Macedonian rule was naturally of critical importance to the Ptolemies who ruled Egypt after the death of Alexander and to the Romans who took over from them after about 300 years. One means of cultural unity and control the Ptolemies hit on was through the creation of a new cult that could be worshipped by Egyptians and Greeks alike. That was the cult of Serapis. Now, Serapis is a new deity who was a syncretism. That's the technical term in, in the history of religion. A syncretism is a, a combination of different deities together. What the, the Ptolemies did, and as far as we can tell, they did this deliberately and perhaps even you might say cynically. 
that is for political purposes, they created this new form of worship. They created a deity in Serapis that was a syncretism between the traditional Egyptian worship of Horus, Osiris, and Isis, and Greek notions of divinity. Serapis combined elements of those three Egyptian deities, Horus, Osiris, and Isis, who were all related, and Greek ideas. For example, Serapis was fully anthropomorphic, as Greek gods were. That is, there's no animal element. Horus, of course, appears as a falcon and so on. Uh, Serapis never does. But it combined the name and qualities of Osiris and Apis, two deities who were broadly popular in Lower Egypt. That is, the region between the old capital at Memphis, just outside modern-day Cairo, and the Mediterranean coast on which Alexandria was founded. So already in this area, there's a rich religious tradition of the worship of Osiris and Apis. And those two figures are combined together, given the, uh, the form of a Greek god, and called Serapis. Now, to cement this new religion, Ptolemy, and this is Ptolemy I, who immediately succeeded Alexander the Great in 323 BC, constructed an enormous serapeum, a sanctuary to Serapis, on high ground in Alexandria, an area within the native Egyptian quarter, which I think makes the primary audience of this key. So the placement of the Egyptian quarter around the temple is not a coincidence, but a statement of the purpose of the temple as a focus of religious attention by the Egyptians. Serapis was a god of fertility and abundance and was the patron deity of the grain supply, Alexandria's major export. Although Alexandria did not remain free of urban ethnic conflict, the cult of Serapis seems to have been a great success, and we'll see it, well, we'll see it how it, it becomes wildly popular, not just in Alexandria, but it spreads across the Mediterranean. Uh, the Roman Emperor Hadrian, for example, visited Alexandria in A.D. 131, and he was captivated by the Serapeum here, and he carried the worship of Serapis to Ostia, the port city of Rome, and then into the city of, of Rome itself, where they built a Serapeum, and to his own villa, where he built a sort of a small-scale mock-up of the Serapeum there. The penetration of the worship of Serapis into the Roman Empire is demonstrated, I think, best by its presence at Timgad, a Roman colony founded in A.D. 100, deep in what is modern-day Algeria, We'll explore the city of Timgad later in this course. Well, the success of Alexandria as a culturally diverse metropolitan area is seen not just in population and trade, but in, in its amazingly quick rise to being a, and some scholars would argue, the Greek cultural center. The needs of the new city, the wealth of the Ptolemies, and their desire to promote Greek culture, as seen in the founding of the museum and the library led to an influx of Greek artists into the new city. They created a new school of sculpture, as well as some of the finest works of art ever created in the Greek world. Some of these were of particular significance, as they were designed to promote Greek culture. A number of marble reliefs, for example, carved in Alexandria and found around the Mediterranean, display complex images um, that are called the apotheosis of Homer. You really can't get more Greek than that, worshipping Homer. The city became a home, therefore, for scores of Greek artists, but also scientists, authors, and cultural figures during the entire 300 years of Ptolemaic rule. It probably didn't hurt that Ptolemy launched a military strike almost immediately after Alexander's death that stole the body of Alexander the Great from Babylon and placed in a tomb in Alexandria to give him that authority. Workshops of artists in all media flourished in the new city, including stone sculpture, terracotta, and glass. Naturally, an entirely new megacity needs new art, but it was that it was the capital of the kingdom of the Ptolemies also meant that they commissioned tremendous amounts of official art in virtually all media. Their 
pumping out propaganda pieces throughout this city, and in fact, throughout the length of Egypt. And it's all coming out of Alexandria. These works were in the new hyper-realistic Hellenistic style that developed from the late classical. Some of the results, such as the glass portraits that were created by these artists, have not been duplicated. Just a word on those glass portraits, because I think they're pretty remarkable. What the, the, the artists did was they would, they would make a piece that we refer to as gold glass. And they would start with a round, usually a round piece of glass, and fasten a very thin piece of gold leaf to that. And then they would take a knife or sharp, sharp knife and carve away the gold leaf to leave a design, usually a portrait, but sometimes an entire mythological scene by revealing the glass underneath. It's like creating a cameo out of gold. Then they would take a second piece of glass, place it on top of the gold to protect it, and fuse those two pieces of glass together. So what you have here is a sandwich of glass, gold leaf that's, that's actually carved into the design, and glass on top. These pieces were often used at the bottoms of drinking cups with the portrait on the interior. So as you would drink, you would see that portrait down below. We find them actually reused a lot of times in, um, in um, Hellenistic Greek uh, cemeteries. Um, they chip out that rondelle with the portrait in it and put it up on a tomb. It's such fine work. It becomes really the, the, the funeral portrait of the individual. In addition to that gold glass, mosaic work was a particular specialty, as so many of the wealthy in Alexandria wanted this type of artistic flooring. These are not the pebble mosaics of Olynthus, nor the black and white abstract designs common in Italy at the time, but cut cubes of multicolored stone brought from all around the Mediterranean set into elaborate figural designs. Many of these mosaics were meant to replicate the illusionistic elements found in painting, but to do so only using only small cubes of stone rather than paint. The effects could be astonishingly lifelike, with realistic mass, shadows, and receding space. One popular motif was the unswept floor, which looked like a dining room floor after an awesome party, with realistic food scraps and, you know, uh, spilled drinking cups scattered about on it. That's something that we see on, well, in dining rooms. Other motifs included still lifes, pet animals such as dogs and birds that looked three-dimensional, set within their own space, and lighted like paintings. Well, despite this explosion of Greek culture, the Greeks in Alexandria were careful to create a local culture that blended and respected local Egyptian traditions. That led to the unique tomb chambers found under Alexandria from this period that combined Greek architectural features, Doric friezes, for example, with images of traditional Egyptian deities, Amun-Ra, Osiris, Isis, and of course Anubis, the god of the underworld. Alexandria demonstrates how a great city in a perfect location can thrive even when the country it's founded for no longer exists. Alexandria survived the breakup of Alexander's empire and then the collapse of the Ptolemaic kingdom in 31 BC. As part of the Roman Empire, it was the critical harbor for supplying grain to Rome. More than that, it was honored by the Roman emperors who came here personally, starting with the first Roman emperor, Augustus, who visited the tomb of Alexander the Great, where, having the sarcophagus opened, he left a wreath on the body. The tomb of Alexander has unfortunately not been discovered, but work in the city continues, and every year more and more of the ancient city is revealed, thanks to the work of archaeologists on land and beneath the sea, tracing the history of this amazing ancient metropolis. The death of Alexander ushered in a new age, referred to as the Hellenistic. This period, from 323 BC to 31 BC, differed from the classical period that came before it. And no more stark difference in culture can be seen than in city planning. In the next lecture, we'll contrast the classical cities of Miletus, Olynthus, and Alexandria with the new Hellenistic city of Pergamon.